Jesus, as Matthew 10 opens, is sending out his disciples to proclaim, here comes the kingdom of God. And not just proclaim it, but to demonstrate it. The instructions that Jesus gave them struck me many years ago and have stuck with me ever since. I was part of a group, well, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, that every time we met, we begin feasting by feasting on this passage or its parallel in another gospel. We called it dwelling in the word. And I don't know, eight, ten times, and each time we were finding more in it. Jesus is sending you and I as well. We prayed in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus is calling us as his body, his hands, his feet, his voice to go out into this world and embody his kingdom, to embody the life of it, to announce that it is coming. The next minutes, we're going to work through this passage, what Jesus said to the dis disciples, sort of unpack it and also see it applying to us as we likewise are sent. Verse 1, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and heal every disease and sickness. These 12 were not just students who Jesus was teaching principles, truths to get in their brain. They are disciples. They are learning life. They are learning ministry. How to follow Jesus. How to do what Jesus does. And at this point, he's sort of sending them out on a practicum sort of a ministry internship, you might say. But he doesn't call them to do this without equipping them. So he gives them power or authority to, as one commentator said, to conquer the devil and cure the world. Hallelujah. Then our text uh, names the 12 apostles, uh, Verses 2, 3, and 4. Uh, I won't, you all just said the names uh, as we read it uh, a little bit ago, either you or Kent. Um, <clears throat> I just want to point out some fascinating things. Um, both Mark and Luke, the other synoptic gospels, uh, also list the 12, and they list them in a very similar order, similar manner. But Matthew has some differences. Only Matthew names them in pairs. You might notice there's six pairs. And Matthew changes how he lists himself. In the Matthew-Thomas pair, he lists himself after Thomas. But in the other two Gospels, Mark and Luke, Thomas, Matthew is mentioned first. And also he adds Matthew, the tax collector. He doesn't call Peter or Andrew or James or John the fisherman, but he says Matthew, the tax collector. Being honest, who he was before Christ. And as far as those ands, uh, another comment on that, Mark specifically says when Jesus sent out the 12, he sent them out two by two. So 
a good guess is that probably that's why Matthew has the ands in there. He remembers the pairs that went out. And it is good for us when we go out to minister to have, have a teammate, have someone to support us, someone who we can talk with, who they can pray with us, uh, they can encourage us, give us some accountability. Verses 5 and 6. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter, enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. So this, this particular mission was exclusively Jewish. They are in Galilee, which is the northern backwater part of Jewish Palestine. And they're to go from village to village there. Very soon, Jesus is going to send out 72 persons on a similar mission. And that is going to be to more than the Jews. And at the very end of Matthew, Jesus says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So hallelujah, the mission does not just stop with the Jews, it goes to the Gentiles, the, the non-Jews, to you and I, hallelujah. But first, they go to their own nation. And their message as they go is verse 7, here comes the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> the kingdom of heaven has come near. They're announcing it. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is that place where God reigns, where God's will is done. Can you imagine a chunk of earth where everything that is done is God's will, like the, that will be in heaven? And what does that look like? Well, here's part of it. Verse 8, heal the sick, raise the dead, resurrection, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely you have received, freely give. The accent in this mission very decidedly falls on caring for physical needs. That's what we've been seeing Jesus doing uh, Chapter 9, the chapter right before, begins with Jesus healing a paralyzed man. Then verse 18 begins that double story of Jesus healing the woman with a bleeding disorder and raising the little dead girl. Uh, we had fun looking at that story the other week. And it ends with Jesus healing two blind men and a demon-possessed man who was mute. Clearly, Jesus wants his disciples to do what he was doing, to continue doing that ministry. And so also today, we are to go out and share the good news of the kingdom, the gospel. And when we are confronted by physical need as we go out, we are to do everything possible to meet that need. When someone is weak or ill or hurting, we come alongside them in the name of Jesus. We demonstrate Christ's love, compassion, grace. We join them in fighting against whatever they're facing. Perhaps we don't have the direct gift of authority to heal, uh, at least not quite the authority that we see that Jesus and the apostles had, although I think sometimes we do have that. But we definitely do have direct authority from Jesus to care for and help those who are suffering. So we should always pray for those who are sick as well as care for them, doing whatever we can to help them. And as we do it, we should be talking about the kingdom. We should be outing ourselves as followers of Jesus, as ones who come proclaiming the kingdom of God. Otherwise, 
people just get the impression, well, those are some nice people. They should know what our niceness comes from. <laughs> Jesus continues his series of instructions, uh, verses 9 and 10. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or staff. Uh, scholars who read the rabbinic texts from that day, uh, they see that those four items at the end mentioned there are the items most often taken on trips. A bag or maybe a backpack sort of thing, an extra garment, uh, footwear, and a staff. But Jesus says the disciples aren't supposed to take those, those normal things one takes on an extended journey, money and those four things. Why would that be? Perhaps Jesus wants them to have the benefit of being totally dependent on God. So often we don't have that. So often, especially in this day and age, we don't. But Jesus wants them to have the joy of seeing that they can trust God. Definitely not taking a staff would be to trust in God. Because this staff was not just, we might think, well, they're taking a walking stick. But no, that was also used to ward off animals, uh, ward off human attackers if that happened as well. But I think it's not, it's probably not just being totally dependent on God, but also totally dependent on people. He wants those that they are ministering to him to, to be able to help them. Because this, these verses end, for the worker is worth his keep. Jesus is not calling them to be beggars. Uh, he's saying people will give them food. People will give them things they need on the basis of their ministry. They are workers. Even the poor that they are ministering to will have opportunity to give to them opportunity to be valued by these apostles, these sent ones. Some of us love to show hospitality to others, but find it hard to receive it ourselves. We don't want to bother others. We don't want to ask things that might impose on others. But Jesus wants us to be in the habit of, or comfortable with, experienced with, in receiving hospitality too. So how often do we let our unchurched neighbor, our co-worker, do something for us? It can be too easy for us to convey the attitude that, that we come into the relationship giving everything, that... <clears throat> You know, those around us <clears throat> just need to be quiet and gratefully received from us. <clears throat> but that's not a good foundation for a relationship. Mutual giving and receiving is much, is much better. So I think that's, that's part of the reason why Jesus said, go carrying no money, no bag. Now, verse 11 Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. So as they come into a town or village, they're supposed to do a little research. Find just who in town is worthy. Um, and what does Jesus mean by that? Does he mean, you know, find like the most prestigious person? That kind of worthiness? No. Matthew, Matthew likes the word worthy. He actually uses it a lot. And he uses it of people who are responsive. People who are receptive. 
For instance, uh, later on in the chapter, uh, chapter 10, verse 37, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. The next verse, whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Chapter 22, another example uh, where Jesus tells, as Jesus tells the parable of the wedding feast uh, that a king was giving for his son. The initial group that were invited to this feast don't come. Verse 8, the king says to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. They didn't respond. As you and I are out and about in our daily life, we look at the people right in front of us in our everyday community who we meet through work or throughout our daily tasks. And those are some phrases from our table groups last Sunday. As we're around those people, we are looking for people who are responsive, who are receptive, who are worthy in that sense. Don't picture Jesus sending you out um, to relationships where it's like grit your teeth like a martyr, you know, kind of a situation. No, Jesus is sending you to the kind of person that you'll enjoy being with. They, they, they like you. They respond to you. Two more notes uh, about this verse. Uh, we may be puzzled about the instruction to stay in that first house and only there until you leave town. Well, just think about it. Why would they move to another house? The only reason would be, you know, maybe better accommodations or better meals or more fun conversation. And what message would that say, especially to the one whose house they left? So Jesus says, stay in the home that first welcomed you, rather than bouncing from house to house. The second note, when we see these instructions as something that Jesus is saying to us, let me get you thinking about something. That town or village that we enter may be another kind of neighborhood. Uh, if we are a family with preschoolers, our village might be the library story hour. If we're a family of soccer players, you know, it might be the soccer field. Uh, if we like to do crafts, if we like to work out in the gym, well then that network of relationships might be where we'll find this receptive person. Verses 12 and 13. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If it turns out to be a worthy home, and that's the same word, worthy, as verse 11, let your peace rest on it. The greeting in that day was Shalom Aleichem, something like that, <clears throat> which means peace be with you. Now, that was the everyday greeting in Jesus' time, sort of equivalent to us saying, how are you? You know, not really a serious question, how are you? But, you know, we just say that out of custom. It's a way of greeting. But it seems like Jesus is thinking their customary greeting, peace be with you. He's thinking of it in, his, in its full meaning, not just words you say without really meaning them. He says, a house that receives the apostles' greeting will have that peace rest on it. I almost picture peace and blessing like, like this ball of spiritual energy, you know, coming through the, through the air from their mouth uh, to rest on this household, uh, rest on this bunch of people. 
We'll end uh, with verses 13 and 14. Uh, if it is not, <clears throat> uh, if it turns out, uh, let's see, where am I? If it is not a worthy home, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Jesus is very realistic. He knows that there will be unreceptive persons. Even ones that we initially thought, they're worthy. They're responsive. So, he predicts this. I mean, he states as much. And even more, he, he arms his disciples beforehand with techniques for meeting such situations. Um, one commentator calls it, Jesus gives them the art of peace retrieving and the art of dust shaking. <laughs> peace retrieving, they, they basically receive back that peace that they tried to give to this house. You know, Jesus is picturing them actually transporting a reality in their greeting. When they said peace to you, they weren't just making a wish, but they were offering a gift, one that can be received or rejected. And if it's rejected, Jesus is saying, that's okay. Just make sure that you still have it when you leave. Dust shaking. This is a, a little rite or ceremony that sort of fortifies the disciples. They're, of course, discouraged when they encounter resistance. But as they shake the dust off their feet, that action communicates, we're, we're just shaking off, sloughing off the negative interaction that was here. And note, Jesus specifically says the dust-shaking rite is to be used for the town, for the house, not for people, not for the individuals. When we are not welcomed, uh, when people don't want the presence of the kingdom that we are bringing, we don't push, we don't shove, we don't try to coerce them. We respect people where they are at. Uh, if they don't want us, we, we can leave. And as I think about ministry, as I think about going out, I think this wiping dust from my feet is what I, I most need. Um, not, not as a message to others, um, but as a message to myself. If I try to express my faith and, I'm, and it's not received, I tend to take it on myself. You know, I, I did something wrong. I, I didn't approach it right. I didn't say the right words. I failed. So I really better not do that, you know, because I'm not good at this. But Jesus doesn't want me, doesn't want you to have that response. He wants us to continue sharing the kingdom, talking about the kingdom, demonstrating the kingdom, saying that it is near. And it really is near if we are there and if we are part of the kingdom, if we are doing God's will, if we are seeking to have God reign in our life, indeed the kingdom did come. If we love Jesus and we love people, we're going to want to make these connections. We're going to want to make each day sort of a mini mission trip.